All right, the sermon this morning is actually going to be a very, very simple sermon, very simple concept, very basic, very rudimentary, but it's one of the things that I walked away with. I mentioned I went to that conference all about soul winning uh, just over the past few days. It's about leading people to Christ. And there are a lot of things to learn in the Bible. There are a lot of truths. There are a lot of things that may be difficult. You know, in, in the book of uh, 2 Peter, in chapter 3, it says that there are things that are difficult, that some of the things that, the, that Paul wrote in his letters are, are difficult and hard to be understood. There is a lot of depth to God's word. There are a lot of things that we ought to, to study and learn and, and you know, try to understand as much as possible. But there's one thing that's actually very, very, very simple, and it is the main thing. It is the number one thing, the primary thing. It's simplicity in Christ. And we find that verse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll start reading again in verse number one. The Bible says, Would to God ye could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. So he's saying, look, I've brought you to Christ. I've brought you as a chaste virgin. I want you to be there. You know, I've brought you to Christ. I've espoused you to that one husband. But here's his fear. Verse number three says, but I fear lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The simplicity that is in Christ, he's referring to, is the gospel. It's salvation. Salvation is extremely simple. It is easy. It is, it is not something that's difficult. As soon as you run into someone that's trying to tell you that you have to jump through all these hoops and you have to do this and you have to do that and wait, let me explain all this to you and you got to turn here and there and you see how this fits, you know, and it starts becoming really complicated, that's not salvation. Amen. That's not salvation at all. There is simplicity in Christ. It is actually very, very, very easy. and It's very simple. But there are a lot of people out there, and this is Paul's concern. And you find this throughout the Bible, this warnings of people who go and they try to change the gospel and they bring another gospel and they, they add to it and they pervert it and, and, and do these things to deceive people. Just as the serpent beguiled Eve, he subtly came to her and was kind of asking questions and trying to... To, to shake her faith a little bit. Did God really say that? Oh no, God didn't say that and just lying to her. And he used subtlety. People do that today. People do that, have always done that. And they're trying to corrupt the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse number four, it says four, and he explains this even further in verse four. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So his concern is that if someone brings another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit, spirit you might kind of go along with them. You might bear with them. And that's why he's writing this, to, to, to give him the warning and be like, this is not what you should be accepting. You say, what do you mean another Jesus? He doesn't say just another Christ or another Messiah. He says another Jesus. There are religions out there today that actually have another Jesus. They, they call themselves Christians. They call themselves, they say that they're believing in Jesus, but the Jesus that they're believing in is not the Jesus of the Bible. Right. It's not the Son of God. The perfect example of that would be a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. Yep. They have a Jesus. I mean, the Mormon church is, is the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, right? They use that name in their church, but they have a different Jesus. They believe that Jesus is just a man who, can, who achieved godhood as any good Mormon can. Yes, they actually believe that. They believe if you're good enough that one day, if you, if you are a good enough Mormon, one day you will be a god of your own planet. That is a different Jesus. They believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers. How blasphemous is that? That is not what the Bible teaches at all. 
The Bible teaches that not only is Jesus Christ the Son of God, He is God. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. We believe in the Trinity. And when you don't believe that, when you have a different, you know, you're calling someone Jesus, that is another Jesus. And it's something that needs to be watched out for because people will come in subtly and try to tell you, th I mean, when I speak with the Mormons, they say, oh yeah, we're Christian too. Oh yeah, we believe pretty much the same thing. They'll tell you that. They will tell that to your face with a straight face and look you in the eyes and say that. Now, when they do that to me, I know that they're lying because I know what they believe, but not everybody does. Not everybody knows all the goofball stuff that they're into. And they'll try to, they'll, they won't even want to admit it usually. Now, sometimes you run into someone who's kind of naive, who probably hasn't been out on the mission field very long, that will just admit to all this stuff, but that's very rare. Because usually the reaction that they get when someone finds out what they actually believe they want to have nothing to do with them, and rightfully so. But their subtlety has been working. You know, back when Joseph Smith founded the Latter-day Saints, almost everybody knew it was just a cult. I mean, they, they, they were kicked out of Illinois. That's why you never, I grew up in Illinois, and never, never ran into a Mormon one time. Why? Because they were booted. They got the boot out of Illinois. They moved over into Utah, but now they're all over the place. They're all over the place out here. They're all over the place in Utah. But people for the longest time knew, yeah, that's a cult. They're weird. Like they're started by one man, by one deceiver, and they've got all these weird doctrines. But we've gotten to the point now to where people just, they're kind of ignorant in general about these things. And Oh, yeah. Oh, you believe in Jesus Christ? Yeah, I believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, great to the point to where it's potential that, you know, we almost had a, a president that was a Mormon, belonged to that cult, just accepted, not a big deal. But I don't want to get too far off into that. Jehovah's Witness is the same thing. I mean, they believe that Jesus is Michael the Archangel. They don't believe in the deity of Christ either. That's another Jesus. And we go on and on in different examples of that where people just create this other Je they could call him Jesus all day long. Hey, there's people, you go down, go down to the Hispanic neighborhood, you'll run into people named Jesus. But that's not doesn't mean that they're the Jesus of the Bible. The people trying to deceive with another Jesus. And that's why he clarifies, whom we have not preached. Because there is the Jesus that they have preached, which is in the Bible, which is in Scripture. And then there's other Jesuses that people want to preach that you cannot find in Scripture, or another spirit which you have not received, or another gospel. And that's why I'm going to be focusing on the most this morning, is this other gospel, or the, you know, the simplicity that we should have in our gospel. Now, there's a few points I want to hit, because one of the reasons why I'm preaching this, I know I'm preaching to a church of people who should be believers. I mean, everyone here professes Christ, you believe in Jesus Christ, He's your Savior. See, I already know this. But one of the reasons I'm preaching this is because we then as people, especially if you have been out soul winning at all, trying to lead other people to Christ, you, you can, you know, as years go by, like I said, this is one of my takeaways from the conference. Being someone who's gone out and knocked on doors and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ for a really, really long time, you might have a tendency to start adding more and more stuff to your gospel presentation, say, oh, I talk to this person, we do this and this, this, and you start complicating things more than it really needs to be. And we need to maintain the focus on the simplicity of the gospel and how simple it really is to be saved. There are plenty of people out there that we have to combat when it comes to this other gospel. What, what, what's another gospel? Well, very, very uh, briefly, I'll try to, try to get through some of these. Probably the number one other gospel that I run into is that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. So you have to believe and repent of your sins in order to be saved. And now you might have heard that before, and maybe you're questioning going, well, I don't understand what's wrong with that. Okay, because a lot of people will preach that and teach that. You say, what, what is the big deal with that? And here's part of the confusion, is that you have people who are really saved using terminology like that. There are people who are good people 
that I know that would use terminology like that or have at least in the past. I don't know if they still will anymore. Just since, since a lot of this subject matter has come to light more recently in and in a lot of churches and has gotten more exposure. But the reason why you, can't, you don't have to repent of your sins and be saved, because what does it mean to repent of your sins? It means you're turning from your sins. You're not going to do those sins anymore. right? When, you, when you're turning from it, you're not going to do it. Well, does God require us to not do sin anymore in order to be saved? No, that's a works-based salvation. That, that is a salvation according to the law, which no one can keep. That's why we have, that's why Jesus Christ came to begin with, is because nobody was able to keep the law. So when you repent of your wickedness or repent of your sins, when you do that, what you're turning to, from is your sin and you're turning to the law. See, people want to want to confuse it and say, oh, you're turning from your sins to Jesus. No, that's that's not a proper application of the turning, because if you're turning from your sins, you're turning from them to not do them anymore, which means you're turning from them to follow the law. Now, as believers, should we do that? Amen and amen. Yeah, there's definitely a place for that. Of course. We should love God's law. We should try to follow God's law. We should be getting sin out of our life. We should be repenting of our sins. But I'll tell you what, that is not a requirement for being saved. Why? There's simplicity in Christ. It's very simple. I show this, this verse to people very often in John 3, 18. We, you know, I show people John 3, 16, you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. You don't give your life to Christ. He gave his son for you. Jesus Christ gave his life for you. you know, we, don't, we don't have to give our life for him. We are not the ones making the sacrifice when it comes to being saved. He made the sacrifice for, for us because he loves us. We just have to accept that sacrifice. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So many people know that verse. It's so widely popular for a very, very good reason because it encapsulates the gospel in one verse. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Wants you to be saved. Believe him. And you are saved. Believe that. Yet so many people come along. No, 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 no. Faith isn't enough. Oh, no, no. You can't just believe. Well, you can't just believe and do it. You know, everything they come up with is just starts to complicate it, start to add different things. And I'll get into that a little bit, but John 3.18, because I show people John 3.16, but John 3.18, in my opinion, is very, very, very simple. It basically boils down everyone in the world into one of two people. It divides and says you're either this person or this person. And it divides between heaven and hell. Very clearly, very distinctly, John 3.18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned. That's very simple. You believe on him, not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. That is simplicity. That is simplicity in Christ. You either have your faith in Jesus, the right Jesus, not another Jesus, just the Jesus of the Bible. You have your faith in him. You are not condemned. You are not going to hell. You are not damned. You don't believe on him. You are for the mere fact that you didn't believe. It doesn't say anything about how often you go to church. It doesn't say anything about how good of a life you live. It doesn't mention any of those aspects in these verses. It just says you either believe or you don't. It's very simple. And we have to recognize and appreciate this simplicity. What the simplicity does is it demonstrates how much God really does love you and really does want you to be saved. 
He could have made the, the way to heaven, the way to salvation, any way he wanted to because he's God. He makes the rules. But he tell, we see over and over in the Bible, you know, God is love. God's not, the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God wants everyone to be saved. He made us as his creation. He made man in the image of God. He loves us. He wants us to be with him. He doesn't force salvation upon us, but what he does is he says, it's a free gift. Amen. It's bought and paid for already. It's already done. All of the work has been done. Jesus paid the way. He lived the perfect life that none of you can do. He offered up himself. He was, was whipped and beaten and mocked and ridiculed, and he bare the sins of the whole world. He died on that cross. He rose again from the dead, paid the whole way in full. And he's saying, you know what? That's paid. That's done. Done. Paid for. In full. He's going, now I've got eternal life. It's all packaged up. It's bought and paid for, and I want you to have it. And all you have to do is accept it. Accept it. It's so simple, a child can understand. It's so simple, someone who's mentally retarded can understand it. And I'm not using the phrase derogatorily, it's, 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 it's reality. There's people that have mental problems that, that can't understand things. People that, that live in a, in a childlike state for their entire life. But this is so simple that anybody can grasp this concept. And that shows you how much God really wants everybody to be saved. But so many people have a problem just accepting how easy it is. Why? It's because of pride. The reason why people don't, they don't even want to think it, it could be that simple. And where does the pride come in? It's because they want to feel like, no, I've worked really hard I'm doing good things, you know, I'm going to church, I'm helping people out. But that guy over there, he's not doing any of these things. He doesn't deserve to go to heaven. He's a drunk. He does, he does whatever, you know, and, and, and you look at that person, and you go, you know, yeah, I, I know I'm going to heaven because, you know, I'm help, I, I've cleaned, yeah, I made some mistakes, but, you know, I've cleaned things up and, I, and I'm working hard to do good things, but that person doesn't. They don't deserve to go to heaven. That's a wicked, proud attitude because you know what? You don't deserve to go to heaven. Nobody deserves to go to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only one that deserved it and you know what he did? He took your punishment for you and he went to hell for three days and three nights after he died on that cross. Don't believe me? Read Acts chapter 2. His soul, you don't have to turn there. I'm just saying, you read that later. His soul was not left in hell. He came to pay for our sins. The Bible says, and you know, we show people this all the time out souling. Revelation chapter number 20, or 21 rather. But the fearful and unbelieving, the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You say, that guy's a murderer. That guy's a whoremonger. That guy's sleeping around. That guy's doing drugs. He doesn't deserve to go to heaven. Well, you know what it also says all liars. You're going to tell me you've never told a lie before? You deserve the lake of fire too. James too explains, you know, you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you're guilty of all. When you understand how God views sin, and you understand that you're not perfect, that's when you could hopefully humble yourself to say, I do need help. I do need a savior. And when you're willing to completely stop trusting in your own deeds and works, that is when you get the salvation. And it's real simple. It's very simple. You just accept, accept the free gift. Turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. You're in, you should be in chapter 11 still. Go to chapter 1. We're going to look at verse number 12. As I mentioned, you know, we need to remember to keep our soul winning method simple. The 
Apostle Paul explained some of how, how he and, and his fellow laborers went and preached the gospel to people. And we see that in verse number 12, 2 Corinthians 1, 12. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you were. He said, when we came to you, it was in simplicity and godly. We, we actually cared, right? We're not just salespeople throwing a sales pitch out there and just, you know, you don't care about the person at all. You're just trying to rag up numbers or whatever. He said, no, we actually cared. We care about you. We took our time. We're bringing in simplicity. We're not trying to add our own fleshly wisdom to this. We're just trying to keep it real simple and basic. We're trying to keep it on the level. Now, God is the God of black and white. God's not the God of the gray area. For, to God, God knows every... Now, we may not, we don't have perfect knowledge and understanding of all of God's ways and everything that, that we, you know, ought to know or everything that's written in the Bible for our instruction. So we tend to have some gray areas sometimes where we're not quite clear. We don't understand always what's right and what's wrong. And we could struggle with that. But you know what? God doesn't struggle with that. Every single situation, every single thing, God's it's either right or wrong. God has no problem with that. The only reason we have a problem is that sometimes we're either emotionally involved, so we have a, a reason to, to not want to believe something or not want to accept something, or we just don't have perfect understanding, which none of us do. So there's going to be areas like that. But again, that can be usually going into more in-depth topics. But the simplicity with Christ, it's very simple. And we need to remember that. And remember that simplicity when you go out and preach the gospel. Sometimes people will bring up all kinds of different situations and all kinds of various things. Well, you know what? The simplicity of Christ should cover all of that. And what, what do I mean by that? Like, a really good example would just be, you know, you don't have to know what every other religion believes in order to preach the gospel to them. Some people have a, have, have a tendency to want to hesitate to preach the gospel to people. Say, well, I need to learn, you know, I need to be able to answer every question that they give me. I need to be able to, you know, you don't. You don't need to do all that. All you need to do is know how you were saved. All you need to do is know what the Bible says about being saved. Whosoever believeth. You know, you know that much. You know that you're saved. You know you have eternal life. You can explain that to someone else. Because every other, every other unsaved religion in the world, whether it's Christian or not, they call themselves Christian, doesn't matter. Every other religion, it's going to boil down to some element of works. Every single one. What separates the truth from the lie is that the truth is it's completely by grace through faith. And has nothing to do with ourselves. A lot of people will give lip service to that, right? They'll say that because you can see verses that say that very clearly, like Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. So yeah, you have lots of people saying, oh, no, no, we don't believe in works, we don't believe in works, but you got to repent of your sins. No, no, we don't believe in works, we don't believe in works. You know, you get it for free, but... If you do something later on in life, God's going to take that away from you. And they, and they back in, they backdoor all this works, and they, and they complicate things. So wait a minute, if, if it's free, I thought it was free. I mean, if, if, if I get a gift, if someone comes and gives me a gift for my birthday tomorrow, and they say, here, Pastor Persons, I love you, Andrew, you have this gift. Would it be wrong to expect that that would actually belong to me? No matter what I do in the future, that they're not going to come back and be like, oh man, Pastor Burson's, you know, I used to like your preaching, but now it's terrible. Give me that gift back. <laughs> you know, whatever, right? You come up with any excuse, you have, anything you want, or, or, you know, maybe I just fall into the gutter and just backslide, you know, halfway to hell. Pastor Burson's, you know, when I gave that to you, you were, you were going strong, but I want that back now. Like, I thought it was a gift. I thought you gave that to me for free. I thought it was mine. That's not the way a gift works. If God gives you a gift, it's a gift. It's simple. It's easy. 
We, that's why the, the, the Bible even uses this terminology. Like in Romans 6, 23, it says that, uh, you know, it's a gift of God. Eternal life is the gift of God. And in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it says that too. It's a gift of God. It's a gift. Because we understand this. It's simple. It's easy. Children understand it. When I give the gospel to children, I understand that concept. I, I explain that to them all the time. Hey, do you like getting gifts? Yeah. Do you get gifts on your birthday or on Christmas? Yeah. You know what's great about a gift? You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to go out and get a job and work for it. You know, my eight-year-old, when she gets a gift, she doesn't have to go out and get a job and do all this stuff. And, you know, because then that wouldn't be a gift. She'd be working for it. Right. She's earning it. You get a gift, someone gives you, hey, man, this is cool. Thank you. And that's what God did for us. It's, it's very simple. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. It's, it's right after 2 Corinthians. So it's the next book after 2 Corinthians. You're going to have the book of Galatians. Again, we're talking about the simplicity in Christ, how simple this is. It's a simple concept, and we need to avoid the people who want to convolute this simplicity or, or, or make it harder than it actually is or confuse it or bring another gospel or preach another Jesus. Ephesians 2.16, again, spells things out very, very clearly, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. If you are trusting in being a good person according to God's law to be justified in God's eyes, you won't be. That's what the verse is saying. You won't be. You can't be. We're justified by faith. We're justified by faith in Christ. He was the one who was perfect. Not me. I'm not going to be justified. Verse number 21 there in Galatians 2 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Again, I'm not, what does frustrate mean? I'm not, I'm not complicating things. I'm not making it more difficult than it needs to be. We're not frustrating it. It's very simple. The way that people frustrate the grace of God is by adding works to it, which is why he says, hey, if it's by the law, if you, if you be saved by the law, then Christ didn't need to die at all. Right. There'd be no reason for him to. If you be saved by being a good person in any way, shape, or form, then there'd be no reason for Christ to die. The Bible teaches us that, and you don't have to turn there, but 1 Corinthians 14, it talks about, you know, speaking with other tongues and stuff in the church and things being done decently in order. But one of the things that it says, just understand that that's a context. It still applies to what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 14, 9 says, So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken, for ye shall speak into the air. We need to be speaking words that are easy to be understood. Especially when you're preaching the gospel to other people. No, you don't need to impress anyone with your college degree or your, your theology degree and use all the big words and let's talk about soteriology. And the guy's like, what are you talking about? It's not about you. You don't need to be lifting yourself up. Okay? Even if you're, if you're, if you're saved and you know what these words mean, it doesn't matter. Like, don't do that. That's going to make things confusing. You're going to put that person off. You're going you're to come off as holier than now because you're using all these words trying to make yourself sound smart. You know what? People don't respond very well to that right. at all. And if you go with godly sincerity, as Apostle Paul did, you're not going to talk like that because you're actually going to want them to be saved. And you're going to break it down to the, to the simplest level and just explain the gospel very simply. I keep on going off on tangents, but I want to make sure that I make this point. Um, turn, if you would, to Jonah chapter 3, because you say, you know what, I've heard repent of your sins so many times. I don't understand still how it works. Well, the Bible actually defines, defines it as works in Jonah chapter 3. One of the problems that people have just with the word repent in general is that they automatically apply it to sin. 
The word repent all by itself, it literally means rethink. Just the definition by itself. So if you know any other languages, or even in English, if, you, if you've ever heard of someone being a pensive person, if they're pensive, that means they're thoughtful. Pensar in Spanish means to think. That's what that root word comes from. So repent, you know, re is again. The pent part is the thinking. So you're thinking again. Unless in the complete sentence, the context has to do with sin, the word all by itself has nothing to do with sin. And we'll see that proven in Jonah 3.10 because God repents. So if the word repent automatically had to do with sin, then how is God repenting? God's not a sinner. God doesn't have any sin that he needs to turn from. Jonah 3.10 says, And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So what did he do? He rethought it. He says, you know what? And if you know the story of Jonah, God was going to destroy Nineveh because they were a wicked city. Now, it doesn't say that God was going to send every person to hell there. It wasn't talking about their souls. It's talking about a nation. God judges nations based on their works. When a nation gets really wicked, God will destroy that nation or send destruction upon them. That is a theme you'll find all throughout the Bible. But that is not the same way he operates in regards to the individual soul. The individual soul is not saved by works. It is completely by faith. The nation is spared through their works, which is why it says in verse number 10 there, the beginning part, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. When people say you have to repent of your sins, is that not the same as turning from your evil way? Same thing. Well, God said that that's works. Turning from your evil way is works. And it is. Making the right choices. If you were a certain way and, and, and following certain behaviors that were sinful, not doing those things anymore is a work. It's a hard thing to do. It's a choice that you have to make. Making the right choices in life in general is not always easy to do. That is actually the harder thing to do. The easy thing to do is just to get off into sin. It's the easier choice to make. It's the path of, of least resistance in one sense because it's harder for you to make the right choice because it, it requires a little bit more work and effort to do what's right. And it works. So when you see here, you have to, if you have to turn from evil way, no, you don't. What, the reason why I think people get confused on the subject is because you do need to recognize that you're a sinner. You do need to understand that you are not perfect. You have to have that, that knowledge of I am not good enough on my own and I actually deserve a punishment for this. Now, normally when a person comes to that conclusion of saying I'm not good enough and I've actually broken God's law, oh man, normally a person will probably tend to feel sorry about that and feel bad about that, right? And maybe not want to do that anymore. Okay, that, that can be something that, that when you recognize, oh man, I didn't realize I was doing things so bad. I didn't realize that what I did actually deserved hell. That, is a common, that, that could be a common way of, of dealing with it. Okay, not wanting to do that again. But having that response of not wanting to do again doesn't mean that that is required to be saved. What's required is to know, hey, I'm in danger and I need a savior. That's what's required. That's pretty simple. But you don't have to make some commitment of, well, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to sin anymore. And that's how I'm going to be saved. And, and that's where the confusion comes in is because some people will be like, well, yeah, well, I mean, when I realized how, you know, how much of a sinner I was, I didn't want to do that anymore. Well, great. Praise God. I mean, that's good. You shouldn't want to do it anymore. But you can't take that element of your response and say, well, everyone has to respond exactly the same way and, they, and, and that means you have to turn from your sins to be saved. Because I'll tell you what, you and everybody else 
even if you had that type of emotional response or even, you know, logical response of saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I bet you went back and sinned again. I bet you did it anyways. Which means no matter how bad you felt, you still didn't completely turn from it because you did it again anyways. And you see, I mean, this is, and, and this is where things start to get more complicated because then people say, well, I mean, yeah, we know we're sinners, but you still have to feel bad about it. Or you have to ask for forgiveness or you have to do this or you have to. And they start adding all of these different qualifiers to like the salvation and, and starting to complicate it. I mean, I talk to people very frequently that say, well, every time you sin, you have to ask for forgiveness. In order to say, you know, you're saved, you put your faith in Christ, you're saved, but then every time you sin, you have to ask God for forgiveness. Sounds good on the surface, but then you start thinking, well, wait a minute. What happens if I ask God for forgiveness every single time I sin and I miss one? Am I going to hell? I mean, I ask for forgiveness all these other times. Am I going to, is, is one, is that enough? How about two? About three, where do you draw the line? You see where it gets real gray? And I say, well, what, what if you don't even know something's a sin? What if you don't even realize it? Because the Bible talks about sinning through ignorance too. And you know what? In the Bible, when you sin through ignorance, there was still, it talks about that in the Old Testament, there was still a sacrifice that needed to be made. It was still a sin. You're still responsible for it. You can't just say, well, I didn't know. God doesn't accept that answer. He's given us the knowledge right here. He's given us the instruction. He says, I, I've, I've given you my word. It's up to you to make sure you know it. That's the way it works in Arizona. You know that just living here, you're expected to know what all the laws are and that you'll be held responsible for breaking the law when, even if you don't know that it's a law. You can't say, I didn't know I couldn't kill anybody. I never read that. I'm not going to care. I'm hungry. I didn't know I can't just go into the store and walk out with a loaf of bread and not pay for it. The law is given. It's up to us to make sure that we know it. And there's no excuse for it. But, and, and for that very reason, it's, that's why you, know, you don't have to ask for forgiveness every single time you sin in order to go to heaven. Because when Jesus Christ paid for it, he paid it in full. All of it. Every single one. Once for all. And I like to explain it this way, too, to people. This is a good way to, to help the concept go. Is Jesus Christ, he died on the cross, right? He paid for the sins of the whole world. Everyone's heard that before. Sounds great. And it is great. It's true. It's absolutely true. But didn't he die before we were even born? I mean, it was like 2,000 years ago. We weren't even born yet. But people get stuck on this concept of, well, if I believe in Christ today, it just covers my past sins. And if I sin again in the future, then I might not still be saved. But if Jesus Christ died before we were born, it means he had to pay for future sins. He had to, otherwise we are lost and we have no hope at all. If, he, if, if, if his sacrifice didn't cover the sins of the future. Well, I mean, this was some 2,000 years ago. I think he paid for tomorrow's sins too. And next year's and the year after that and the year after that up, you know, for as long as this earth is going to be around. He paid for all the sins. So when you accept Christ today, it doesn't just cover your past sins up to whatever age you are in life. He already, he already knows the sins you're going to do in the future. And he's already paid for them when he died on the cross. It's done. It's simple. It's a package deal. You get eternal life. Eternal means forever. You receive that gift. It covers past, present, future. It covers all of your sin. It's a very simple concept. You know, this is one of the reasons why when we go out soul winning, the majority of people that end up getting saved and putting their trust in Christ are younger people. They get the simple concept. They haven't had enough time going through this world to just be bombarded with all of these different complications, all of these different things to make it just so much more difficult to understand. It's easy. It's a, it's a simple concept. Very easy for, to, to pick up. But there's too many false prophets out there and workers of Satan that are going around and complicating things and messing. They're bringing up other Jesuses. They're bringing another gospel. They're bringing everything else to warp and pervert and twist the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is so simple. And we need to be careful when we go out that we use words easy to be understood. 
when we try to teach other people about being saved, that we keep it simple. Don't complicate the matter. Now, one other point I just want to bring up when it comes to, turn if you go to 1 Thessalonians 2. It's the last place I'll have you turn. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. When we explain salvation by grace through faith, it has nothing to do with your, your own works and your own actions. There is another basic concept that is important to be mentioned as well, though. Because there are things that we understand naturally. So one of the things we understand naturally is that when you do something wrong, there's a consequence for your actions. Right? Anytime. We do, when you do anything, there's a consequence for your actions, whether good or bad. There's a consequence associated with that. And I think one of the reasons why people balk at the teaching of this free salvation, they get this incorrect thought. Because I hear this all the time as well when I talk to people. They'll say, well, wait, so you think you could just do whatever you want and you're just fine? And that's the way they word it. You think you can just do whatever you want and everything's okay, and you're just fine. No. And this is where, again, confusion can come in, and we need to make it simple and easy to be understood. What we're saying is that your eternal life is a gift that's been bought and paid for, and that no amount of sin that you do will take that away from you. You still have eternal life. But the other concept that needs to be, that needs to go along with that is the concept that when you do receive eternal life, when you do trust in Christ, you are born again. You become a child of God. And then God treats you as a son, as his son, which means that he will discipline you when you go off and do things that you're not supposed to do. But that discipline or chastening or punishment happens in this lifetime. As long as we're on this earth, he's going to treat us that way when we sin, when we break his commandments. But he doesn't kick us out of the family no matter how bad of a child we are. My children are always my children, no matter what they do. Again, another very simple concept that everybody understands. No matter what my child does, I am not opening up my oven and putting on broil and locking them in there. That's never going to happen, ever, once. They don't even have to worry about that happening. Now, they have a, a proper fear of me, as we ought to have a proper fear of God, but I'll tell you what, they never have to fear about me doing something like that to them. And they're not perfect, but you know what? I still expect them to follow my rules. Even though I know that they're not going to follow all of them, I still expect them to. And when they break my rules, there is a punishment. Because I love them and I want them to learn and to grow and to learn to do what's right and to not do what's wrong. And that is the same way salvation works. Is that when you're born into God's family, he lo you never have to worry about going to hell. That is no longer an option. That has been bought and paid for. But your life here absolutely is going to be determined by your actions the things that you do. So if you decide just to say, you know what, Heavenly Father, I don't want to listen to a word you have to say. Well, how well would that go over in a household? I know, not going to go over very well in my household, I'll tell you that much. And it's not going to go over very well with God either. He will make sure that you are being punished appropriately in this life. So you don't just, it's not this, I can do whatever I want and everything's just fine because it's not just fine. What it means is I could do whatever I want and I'm still in the family. I'm still, I'm still a son. And you know, we have families on this earth that may say, you know, like you kick someone out of your family, right? It happens. But nothing can change the fact that they're still the child. That is a blood DNA bond that never, ever, ever changes. Amen. 
And when we're born again, it's a spiritual bond because the spirit is the new creature that's born again inside of you. It's a spiritual birth. And the Bible teaches all throughout the Bible that it's our flesh that causes us to sin. It's our flesh that, that drives us to do things against God. Doesn't it make sense that when we die, this flesh remains here? What's left? We got our spirit. That new born again spirit. The Bible says that whatsoever is born of God in 1 John chapter 3 doth not commit sin. Why? Because his seed remaineth in him. It's talking about the spiritual creature that was born when you put your faith in Christ. There's no sin in your spirit. And again, it's not alleviating responsibility, but it's just the difference of that, that new birth that's born of God that makes you a child of God. Hey, that's, that sinful flesh is here. There's no more sin left to you. Your spirit goes to be with, with God in heaven. Very simple. Very simple concept. Very easy. Grasp. And we need to maintain that simplicity when we talk to others. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's the last place we'll just look at some of these verses here. And I want to apply that. You're here today. You're saved. You say, you know what, Pastor Burns? I believe all of that stuff. I've believed all that for a long time. I've been saved for a long time. Well, let's not forget that and overcomplicate things when we go out and try to tell other people about Jesus Christ. You don't need to read a million other books by all these different people to try to help you explain it to people. Let's just keep it simple. Because people will get that. You're, you know, we, if you overcomplicate things, you're going to make it harder for people to understand. Just keep the simplicity there. Use, use the examples the Bible uses. Use the things that the Bible uses to, to explain these concepts, and people will get it. Second Thessalon or, excuse me, First Thessalonians. I hope I didn't say second. First Thessalonians chapter number two. We're we'll start reading in verse number one. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. The Bible reads. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men but God which trieth our hearts. He's saying, we were put in God entrusted us with the gospel, the good news, salvation. He's entrusted that to us. So when we receive that trust from God, we have to use it then appropriately saying, and he says, not as pleasing men. So when we go out and preach the gospel, it is not about making people happy. When you tell someone that they're a sinner and they deserve to go to hell to pay for their sins, that's not pleasing to men. And oftentimes, you know what else is not pleasing to men? is when you tell them, you can't earn it. There's nothing you can do that you, that's going to make you good enough to go to heaven. That is a pleasing concept to a man. Just be like, you know, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to get it done. I'm going to achieve it. I'm going to do it. That is a, a that, that speaks to pride. And pride feels good. To sin, but in your flesh it feels good. But we take the gospel and we don't please men. We don't say the things that just men want. We're, just, we're, we're trying to please God. God's the one who's trying our hearts. We're, we need to go out and just preach what God wants us to preach. Keep it simple. Let's keep reading here. Verse number five. He says, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. We don't go around flattering people. No, it doesn't mean you're being mean to people either. You're, just, you're not, you're, you're not you know, trying to be this salesman. And you're not trying to just, just lift people up. You're just preaching, just giving them the truth. Just, this, is, this is salvation. Plus nothing, minus nothing. There it is. Verse number six. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. You're saying, we didn't even ask you for anything. We said glory, like, like receiving things. We didn't, we didn't receive any money from you. We didn't receive any help from you. 
We just, we just did it all. We didn't want to be burdensome to you. Verse number seven, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. And this is the attitude and the mindset that you really ought to have when you go out and preach the gospel to people, is that you care about them, and you care about them so much that you're, taking, you're investing your time, you're investing your energy, and, and you love them and care for them enough. You try to explain the gospel very simply and willing to impart your own souls. That's the way the Apostle Paul did it. I think that's a good model for us to follow. Love people enough to, to really try to get them to understand the gospel clearly. Verse number nine, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard from uh, of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. What did they do? They came to him, they preached the word of God. They didn't just preach their own opinions and just their own thoughts. They preached God's word. They preached the good news. That's what they came in with. In sincerity, in truth, in simplicity. That's what it takes. Let's not be adding too much to our gospel presentation to the point to where you're making it complicated or confusing. Let's not be deceived by the people who want to change the gospel and bring in another gospel and bring in another Jesus and try to slip works in there somehow one way or another. No, there is simplicity in Christ. It is very simple to understand. It's, easy. it's so simple to understand that my children at you know, six years old, seven years old were able to get saved because they put their faith in Jesus Christ and they understand that it's that simple. Thank God for the simplicity because if it were complicated, we would, we would mess it up. We wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to keep it on our own at all. Thank God he's paid for everything one time. He loves us so much. He says, I bought and paid this for you. Just believe it. And let's share that with other people. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the simplicity that's in Christ. The simplicity of the gospel, dear Lord, help us to never complicate your words and never complicate the gospel, Lord. Help us to be effective in being able to show other people how to be saved. Pray that you please stir up our, our hearts and our souls to be able to want to, to go out, to want to reach people, to want to do more, to serve you, and to, and to bring other people to you. God, for as happy as we should be for our own eternal life and forgiveness of sins, Lord, help us to share that with others and to lead other people and be excited about it and show them how they too can have eternal life and be a part of your family, dear Lords. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.